managing your finances or tracking your finances, doing bookkeeping, whatever you want to call it, I really think that it puts money in perspective in a way that makes it easier for you to make those adjustments in your mind. Like once you see how money works in like, I mean, it's quite simple, really. It's money in, money out. Hi, this is Garrett Sutton, and you're listening to the Average Joe Finances Podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you smash the like and subscribe buttons. If you're listening to our podcast, go leave us a five-star review. All of our links can be found in the video description or show notes below. Hey, welcome back to the Average Joe Finances Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Cavagioni, and today's guest is Joe DeSanto. So Joe, super excited to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, man, Mike, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. I like that your show is called The Average Joe. You couldn't be any closer to me, though, it, right before we got on the air, you said your middle name is Joe and you're obviously Italian. So you're like a paisan over there. Yeah, you got a little bit of a claim to the name right there. <laughs> I was actually going to bring that up and be like, this is the perfect podcast for you to be on. I am the average Joe. I really actually feel like that. There, for a long time before I started my blog, my plan was to write a book and it was going to be, it wasn't going to be called the average Joe book, but I was going to call it the regular guy's guide to being moderately successful. I like it. <clears throat> yeah. I like it. All right. <laughs> My hey, mother-in-law was just like, I don't get it. Wouldn't you want to be really <laughs> successful? I'm like, such a mother-in-law thing to say. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> Nothing I do is good enough. <laughs> no. All right. Hey, so Joe, I'd like to start this off the same way I start every podcast episode. And we want to know more about you. So if you could share a little bit about yourself, share your story. Who is Joe DeSanto? I'm an Italian boy from Providence, Rhode Island. I grew up, I grew up in, I guess it's relevant. I grew up in a blue collar-ish Italian neighborhood, to be honest with you. And, but oddly, <clears throat> my parents split up when I was 10, so things diverted. But first in years, my, living with my dad and he owned a plumbing and heating business. So while we were like this owner folks of the neighborhood, we still own like a blue collar sort of endeavor of a business. And I did work at the business for a few summers, cleaning up boilers and like coming home with a bunch of snut, soot up my nose. And I was like, ah, I don't know if I want to do this. I want to own a business, but I don't know if I want to own this business, which was good because actually my older brother and cousin who had been working there for longer than me, they ended up taking over the business and they're still doing it. So yeah, I grew up in that way. And I mentioned that because I do think that like, Growing up in a family where a business is owned actually was meaningful. It was like a subconscious thing where you don't see as own, uh, owning a business as some unattainable, unrealistic thing. You're like, oh, I can own a business. I think Henry Royal Company had maybe 10 employees or something, not too big, but nothing. And a lot of customers in Rhode Island, people knew who we were. You know, we're still there. Been around for probably 50 years now. So it just made it seem like an attainable thing. And it definitely put it on like my radar as like, whatever I do, I kind of want to own a business eventually. So that was always lodged in the back of my mind from my young growing up. But anyway, veered off from that. I also had an interest in art, photography, that sort of stuff. I actually ended up going to college and I was an art major. I was a like fine art photography and transitioned that into a career in post-production, which is basically like like photography and motion post-production is it's called post-production because I don't know how familiar you are you with uh, you or your audience are with this kind of thing but in the film business or commercial making or web video making whatever you do the production first you go shoot the footage with the camera and whatever and then post-production is everything that happens after you shoot the stuff so the editing visual effects design animation sound design all that sort of stuff I ended up, instead of going the photography route, got into post-production, originally with the intent of being like a visual effects artist, and then eventually decided that <clears throat> I was more into the business side of things. I was a good communicator, talker, 
socializer, good at like rallying the troops, all that sort of stuff, and went the producer route of the biz. And but eventually segued into owning my own business with my friends in Los Angeles. I went from New York. I went to school in Massachusetts, moved to New York a couple of years, and ended up in LA. Started a post production company with my friends, and we did it for. I did it with them for gosh, almost fifteen years. It was very successful. They cashed me out begrudgingly at the time. They were supportive, but I was, I want to go, I don't know, do something else. And they're like, what, what are you doing? But they continued on. And uh, oddly in that whole era of me leaving the business, they were like, what if we, I always did the finances for the business. So I was sort of the CEO, CFO. And they were like, obviously we got to find people to do all these things that you do, but what if we just pay you to do the finances and you could do them from wherever. And I was like, Yes, that sounds great because I enjoy that. Like I've always been into personal finance, hence probably why I'm on the show and uh, always leverage that interest into using it for my business and all sorts of things. And I was like, yeah, that's a great idea. Actually, I, I don't particularly have a great plan at this point. I just need like a change at that time in my life. And that became my new thing. Like I now am what I call a fractional CFO. So I'm a CFO for like multiple small businesses anywhere from five to 30 employees. And then, but I've taken that a step further where I say to the owners of the businesses, listen, man, you own a business, it's your passion, I get it. But ultimately you do this to make money. And if you're not taking care of your personal finances, in addition to your business finances, you are missing half of the picture. You're seriously hamstringing your personal future, because this business will run its course. It will come to an end. You will get tired, whatever it might be. Maybe you're aged out. Maybe you don't want to do it anymore. And you're going to be looking at, okay, can I stop working? Can I work less? What is? What are my options? And it's all that quote unquote planning that everyone knows they're supposed to be doing, but very few people understand really what's involved and what exactly they're supposed to be doing. All that planning is supposed to set you up for the future. And sadly, very few people do it. And most people end up shortchanging themselves down the road. So I am <clears throat> trying to help my clients avoid that, number one. And then through my site, Play Louder, I am trying to evangelize the, uh, the benefits of managing your personal finances like a business. Yeah, that Joe, that is fantastic. So just, it came out pretty succinctly, actually. Yeah, just the way that you transitioned your own career, right, from where you went from doing this post-production to like sticking to just the finance piece and, and what you've learned about doing finances for a business and how you can use that in your own personal life for your personal finances, I think is fascinating because Thanks. a lot of times people don't look at their life like a business, right? They just like, yeah. they, everything's transactional and I think and, mostly and, and they're emotional. treading water. They're treading water a lot, a lot of the yeah. time. They're busy. They have kids. It's hard. Yeah. And then they're just kind of, I know I'm supposed to save. I'm going to throw 5% in some account, I think, and cross my fingers basically. And Fortunately, that doesn't get it done. That wouldn't get it right. done if you were a business. <laughs> and it's not going to get it done for you personally either, unfortunately. <clears throat> yeah, you have to take that time to sit down <clears throat> and actually look over what your finances look like. Thankfully, my wife does that for me. Like, even though I'm the guy that's here on Average Joe Finances podcast, right? I'm the one talking about this stuff all the time. My wife's the one that ropes me in and says, hey, we need to like nail down on this. Yeah. We need to do this. And I'm like, oh. Okay, cool. Yeah, let's get to it. So she keeps me on my toes. So nice. that's every that's you only sure. need one of those in a marriage. Right. But I always say to people, you need one. So to like my old employees who I mentored a lot, especially from like when they got out of college, I'm like, I know you're not gonna want to hear this. Okay. I can tell you're not particularly the bookkeeping type. And you should marry basically a bookkeeper or accountant, essentially. <laughs> They're like, I would never just marry for basically someone who could like manage finances. And I'm like, that's a mistake. Your parents <laughs> were right. You can yeah. only get so far with that kind of argument. You lose what's, people quick. What's some of the biggest causes of divorce, like besides infidelity? It's finances. It's money. Yeah. Like it's people it's fighting over that stuff. So is that is something that you can alleviate a lot of that pain and stress by either learning this stuff yourself and putting it into action or making sure you have the right person in your life that, that does it as well. I'm a lifelong learner. So I keep yeah. learning while my wife keeps making me do it. So. I always say, I look at my finances almost really like a hobby. It's like, 
some people are just into it. I actually just, I am, I always liked it. I find it soothing. It gives me, it makes me calm because it makes me feel like I'm in control of a thing. But for whatever the reason, I like it. I'm happy to do it. And it's really benefited me in a variety of ways. But I don't like to exercise. You know, that would be a good thing to do too, but I just hate that. But my wife likes that. So her hobbies, health and fitness, my hobbies, finance, those are a good combo for a successful union marriage and whatever. Ask yourself, I say to people like, really be honest with you. If you don't think you're going to get to this, if you're going to just put it off for 20 years, which believe it or not, people do that long, you, maybe you should pay someone to help you with it because you will... I truly believe you will save far more than it will cost you to have a coach or whatever you want to call it in this department than to just put it on the back burner. So if like, it's not your thing and you hate it, just pay someone, figure it out. It's just, it's like a personal trainer, but for your money, super worth it. And if you're like, I don't know if I can afford it, be like, well, don't buy the C-Do, get the personal finance trainer, basically. Yeah, no, that's a great <laughs> point. It's sometimes you just, you need that, that voice of reason, right? That's going to help you stay on track and stay disciplined. If you can't really discipline your, to stay on top of these things. Like, I know for me, like it's always a battle that I have to be like, no, I can't buy this should go. Cause I've always been a spender, right? Not a yeah. saver. My wife's a saver. I'm a spender. I had to change like my mindset on what I'm spending money on. I'm more focused on, I want to buy assets that will get me that thing that will yeah. pay for the thing that I wanted. So instead of buying a, a new laptop, let me go invest in Apple and let those dividends go buy me a new laptop in the future. Sure. Just little things like that. I agree but with it's, you. It's changing I'll that say, mindset. I will say that yeah. What I think managing your finances or tracking your finances, doing bookkeeping, whatever you want to call it, I really think that it puts money in perspective in a way that makes it easier for you to make those adjustments in your mind. Like once you see how money works in like, I mean, it's quite simple, really. It's money in, money out, net profit or net loss, net profit good, net loss bad. But you're kind of like, oh, but okay, I see that I spend X, Y, Z on this and this, but oh yeah, I don't even know why I spend money on that. I'll stop spending money on that and I'll solve my problem. Or I won't spend money on this one thing that I want to spend it on regularly so I can get this other thing that I really want. And if you can train your mind, as you said, to get the things that you really want to be money producing assets, that's the golden egg basically right there. Yes. What would you say to someone that's at that point where they just, they're having trouble doing it themselves? Like, how would you tell them like, they, they hate the whole thing about, I don't want to track my finances. Like it's either one, it's too complicated or two, I just don't have the time to do it. What would you say to somebody like that? First, I would say, don't be a baby. And I'd probably use a different <laughs> word that started with P. Oh No, I'm a hard ass coach. I'll be honest with you. If you're going to be one of those people that whines that it's like too annoying and hard and saving for your future is just a pain in the butt. You deserve everything that's coming to you as far as I'm concerned. You got to be serious about it, but it's not that hard. So like, you don't have to like, it's not like you're going to go climb Mount Kilimanjaro or run a marathon. Those things take a lot of hard training. This is like sitting in front of a computer for one hour a week. So if you're going to complain about that, because it's going to end you up on the beach sipping like Mai Tais earlier than 65, I don't know, maybe get some other things you got to work on. But, but I would say, get serious about it. Don't be a baby. But again, ask yourself like, all right, I'm going to take it serious today. But even me, like I talk about exercise. Many times I've started an exercise regimen and I just, I, as much as I know it's good for me and like I was overweight and all that, I just wouldn't keep up with it. You know what I mean? And, and I do have a trainer now, <laughs> ironically. This is, you can actually pay someone to do this for you. Like you can't pay someone to go exercise for you. You know what I mean? This is even easier than that. But you have to say, okay, I'm not going to do it or I am going to do it. If, but if I'm not, I'm going to seek and either I'm going to do like a coaching thing where I do it, but I get like once a month, I answer to somebody, they're checking in on me. Or maybe I actually pay someone to do this and it costs me a few hundred bucks a month. But, and I don't do something else for that, but I know that having someone do it and me being able to make good decisions going forward and strategic decisions going forward about the business of me. I'm going to save more than I'm going to spend. But those are hard things for people to get their head around. I don't know why. I guess it's the, it's the spending part, ironically. But yeah, it's, but I always say to people too, if you're young, 
<clears throat> it's the easiest time to start because some of the, the, my old employees that I said he's a mentor, they would be like, oh, why do I need to do that? I have three things. I got like a checking account. I got my car loan. I got my student loan. And I'm like, this is the easiest time to get yourself in the habit. It would take you like no time at all to get in the habit of like tracking this, understanding how it works. And like now, like later, as you build things in your financial life, assets, real estate, whatever it is, you're not like starting from scratch. It's just like you're adding on to this system that you already understand. And it's funny, you said something earlier about how I turned my business knowledge into this personal finance thing. But the funny thing, it didn't happen that way. I originally started with personal finance. Like in college, I paid for my own college. I had student loans. I was paying for stuff on credit cards. It was stressing me out. And I was like, I got to start like tracking this. I know that like probably tracking, it's not going to change anything because I don't earn any money right now, but I got to know what's happening. And I started doing it in a notebook. And then I was like, there has to be some computerized way to do this because doing it in a notebook is dumb. It takes forever. And I got to use a calculator to add it all up at the end of the day. There was, it was called Quicken. I started using Quicken and using Quicken actually, because as I said, I was a photography major in college. Using Quicken actually taught me how to do business finances. I was just doing them for my personal life. And it was very small scale. I had an income for my job. I spent my money every month on my rent, whatever. And at the end of the month, I'd look at it and go, wow, I didn't, I made less than I spent. I lost more money this month. That's a major problem I have to solve. It got me motivated. I quit my job. I went and freelanced. I made a higher hourly rate. I controlled my schedule more, all these things. And then I was like, okay, I've turned it around. Now I make more than I spend. Then it's like, okay, I'm into this. What now, what else can I do? And then I was like, I got to buy a house. I think I looked into that. I'm like, makes sense. That was a major goal. And by the time I got around to starting a business, I literally took, by that point, I had turned my working into like a freelance thing. I incorporated myself and all that. And I had a business that made money that I was able to go get a loan with. And when I started the business, I actually, they didn't give me any money for it, but we took my Quicken file because we took my business that was, I had opened for over a couple of years as a freelancer and made that the business for the business we started. And we took the Quicken file and converted it to a cookbooks file and continued on basically. And I made them partners in this entity. And it was like literally doing personal finances prepared me to run a business. And it got more complicated from there naturally. But like I was in this mode of getting it. Like it was not a mystery. It's like money is honestly not all that complicated. But it was like I had been training myself with the personal finances and then I was the CFO and then I was like getting financing. Then I, we bought more real estate and it's like, I did all the finances for all of it. And then we were making many millions of dollars a year and I was still doing the finances, but I had now an employee and bookkeeper and I would only check in on it every Friday instead of, but in the beginning I entered all the bills, cut all the checks, signed them, put them in the mail. So I really think that process is like really important for making you an adult with money, yeah. like making you like, like a money maker. So Joe, as you were going, I wrote down something that you had said that I thought was very interesting. And you said that you were focusing on the business of me and basically turning self into your own business. Like you originally said, when you started the quick and file and everything and started putting all of that together, doing everything on your own. Now, what was that inflection point for you where you decided that I'm going to step away from my job and start freelancing, making my own schedule, becoming my own business? What was that period in your life or when did that, that switch flip on for you? Well, it was basically in my first job, which frankly, I really liked. It was a nice company. I loved like the owners. It was like, it ended up being exactly the company I ended up making. Though my company had about 30 employees. This company had about 50. It was in Manhattan. It was a post-production company, but they paid their entry level staff, like the guys that worked in the quote unquote mail room, shipping room, just like next to nothing. And it was, it's the kind of industry where a lot of people want to work. There's a lot of demand. There's tons of kids coming out of college and it's like, they can pay you very little and like people will still do jobs. Most of the people in the shipping room were from New York or New Jersey, were living at home. So it was like, they were paying like six fifty an hour or something. That, granted, this is in 1999, but still, that was like almost 
qualified as like poverty income in New York City at the time. I'm and from I was New York, and I was making more than that working in a warehouse yeah, on I an mean, assembly line. So, 275 a week, I shit you not. And Jeez. but there is supply and demand at work. No, I don't know if most of those kids were lining up to work in warehouses, but they wanted to work in post production where it was sexy and what have you. But after nine months, I was like, I went to the owner and he liked me. He was Italian. I was Italian. You had that in common. And I was like, dude, I just, I don't live at home. I'm living in an apartment here. I'm losing money every month. I want to work here. I like it, but like, I just can't work here at this rate. And he's like, I hear you. And but I just can't do for you that I'm not going to do for everybody in the shipping room. And I'm not going to do it for everyone in the shipping room. So you will make more money. You're in for the proving ground, whatever you want to call it. And there's a pot of gold here. And he wasn't lying. There is a pot of gold in post-production. You can make a lot of money. They really kind of weed people out. And I was like, I can't do it. I can't stand. I I'm running the business of me. And right now the business is me is losing money, like just like reckless abandon that. What that means is my credit card tabs are going up and up and up and up so I can work for you. And so to me, I was like, the business of me is failing. So I went to my one client and said, I need you to pay me more. He said, no. And I said, the business of me needs to be a success and I'm going to go seek my fortune elsewhere. And I went out and freelance and I went to $20 an hour immediately. Now, granted, I wasn't working that much at first, but I was like, that was like really great. And that it got me in this out of the worker mentality. I don't like rely on this one place to give me my living. Like I'll go out and make my living working for multiple clients and they'll pay me more. And that was like a step in the business ownership direction. But like I said, I always had that in the back of my mind for my own family where I was like, yeah, business ownership it's doable. And it's funny, like so many small businesses, it's the same operation. It's like you have the talent or the creatives or the plumbers or whatever. Then you have the office people or the producers or the client managers or whatever. And whether it's construction, advertising, plumbing, it's like the same sort of team setup. But as a freelancer, you kind of do all those parts. You're the product, you're the sales, you're the client manager all in one. Yeah, but it's and also it like, like a forcing function, right? Because like now you have to produce like you have to make this happen or you're not going to get paid. Whereas when you're working at the company, it's kind of, I'm still going to get paid depending, you know, if the company, yeah, even my paid, productivity kind of sucks today, I'll yeah. keep getting paid at least until they figure that out and can pin it on me <laughs> yeah. and then I'll get a warning or whatever. I will say one of the tips I can say to young people is get out of the worker mentality as soon as you can. Don't get trapped in the worker mentality. I actually give away all this content. I also have paid courses and what have you, but all my content's organized into three pillars, I call them. There's the personal finance piece, which is track your finances, run the business of you, blah, 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 like all the stuff I've been talking about. There's the small business or entrepreneurial piece where it's like, don't be a worker mentality person. You have to be an entrepreneurial mentality person. And that might mean owning your business, but not always in every career can you go start a business. If you're in the you know, semiconductor business, like you can't go start the next Intel super easy, but you can be entrepreneurial in the way you approach your job. You make yourself indispensable. Like when you go ask for that raise, they have to be so scared that they're going to lose you because you're so awesome <laughs> that they give you the great raise that you want. And they give you 10 or 15 or 20%. So there's the entrepreneurial piece. And then there is the investing piece. Like once you, you through entrepreneurship, you earn money through personal finance, you manage it and you make sure you keep a net profit. That net profit is your savings. The investment piece takes the savings and goes and has it make more money for you while you're at your day job uh, or yeah. you're sleeping. And yeah, so it's, it's just incredible. It's incredibly important to not get trapped in the worker mentality because it makes you lazy. It's just like, you have to stay motivated, be awesome, stay awesome, always improve, like just blow your employer away. Or say, you employer, I don't need you anymore because the client will come with me if I leave. That's how important I am. And usually that's how people start their own businesses. They are so critical to the client, the person that's truly paying the bill, the employer themselves of us is not even paying the bill. The client is. You are so critical to the client. When you tell the client you're leaving, they go, where are you going? Because I'm going with you. And you go, oh, I'm going to start my own business. And they go, I will be your first customer. 
That's how many businesses are started. And often yeah. lawsuits sometimes happen in, after, you know, when that happens, but that's just <laughs> part of, that's part of the game of leaving and taking clients. <clears throat> yeah. No. So your three pillars that you discuss is, I think is super important, right? To, for people to, one is, is where are you going to generate that income from, right? Two is how are you going to manage that money and make sure that you're, you have this net positive that you can save. And then three, where are you putting those savings that, you know, you're getting as you, as you get this net positive, right? Yeah. So actually I wanted to ask you about that, right? So since we talk about investing a lot and stuff like that, what is it that you particularly like to invest in with your net profit? Yeah. Historically, I'm predominantly a real estate investor. That's the area that I'm always gravitated, gravitated towards. I feel like ultimately real estate provides a superior return for less risk. I just think that's generally true. I also am a huge proponent of own, what I like to call owning your residence. I don't like to call it buying your house because as it, when I say own your residence, basically I look at you as twofold. We're always renters. And Robert Kiyosaki, I feel like sadly said, your home isn't your investment. It's your biggest expense. I don't think that's true. I think housing is your biggest expense and you will always be a consumer of housing you'll always be a renter essentially the question is, is will you also be a real estate investor and own the house that you rent right because if you don't own the house you rent you'll just be renting a house from someone else unless you live at home for the rest of your life or in practical reality if you end up in like manhattan in a rent controlled apartment building and you can be there for 20 years, like under superiorly below market rent. You might be able to justify not buying a house and investing that money in the market. But by my calculation, and I am a person that does the math, by and large, the math on owning your residence just blows away renting and then investing that money in the market. Yeah, no, I agree. Because I agree. the government it incentivizes us through tax breaks to own real estate. Yeah. Owning your residence is actually a better deal than owning a rental property because you get better tax breaks as the owner occupant. So I always say to people, focus on real estate for the most part. Your first investment should be buying your property. It is an investment. All of the houses I've owned, I treated as investments. They've all made me a lot of money but I've owned three residences and a sum total of 16 properties. So it's still a small portion of the total. And like, oddly, when we got the business going, a few years in, we needed to go into a bigger space. And owning my personal residence was such a success. I was like, why would we rent a building, a commercial space from some other owner? We need to own our business home as well. We did that. There, there again, the government came in and helped us out with the SBA loan program. We could get in for 10% down, blah, 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 blah. In COVID, if you had an SBA loan, you literally got six free months of payments on your loan for signing one piece of paper. No, didn't even have to pay it back. Like the government wants you to own real estate and they guide your actions in business and in real estate through tax incentives. Now, if the government took away all the tax incentives of owning your residence, we could revisit this conversation, but until then. So after I bought my houses and the building for my business, I just went on and bought more rental real estate. And uh, up until recently, that was about 75% of our net worth. And, but I did decide I'm real estate heavy. I might, and I thought the market might be coming down and my real estate was really up. So I started to sell some of the properties with the intention of taking some of the equity, moving it into other things. So I moved some of the equity into the markets. I'm trying like a, like an index universal life policy concept that's geared towards long-term retirement income, tax retirement income. I'm trying a few different asset classes. So I'm down to 50% real estate, probably 30% market, 20% alternatives. You know, okay. Cool. Yeah. I have a permanent life insurance policy as well. But one of the things that I like that you had mentioned, yes, Robert Kiyosaki has said that buying your, owning your home is a liability and not an asset. But I think it depends on how you use it. With my own personal property, I, I've even, I've taken out a HELOC on it and I've taken the money from that HELOC to pull equity out and buy more real estate. Yeah. Exactly. So I used it as a tool for liquidity to essentially get more cash flowing assets. So to me, those other cash flowing assets wouldn't have happened without this initial residence. So it has become a investment property for me, my own of personal home. But, but honestly, if you look at it in the way that, okay, you're not 
the just it's not your home you're the renter you're also the property owner you're paying potentially a roughly market rate to be the resident there and when you do the math on the property with your you as the real estate investor getting a market rate rent based on your fixed non expenses for the most part it is cash flowing like when someone owns their home outright right people say oh you save all this money because you're only paying taxes and insurance and that's true but if you look at it in the way that no i'm still paying market rate rent because i would be paying market rate rent if i didn't own this place and i was renting joe blow's house two doors down so the fact that i own it outright means the market rate rent i'm going is producing great cash flow for me now from there you would go is getting this cash flow and not having a loan at 3% where I could go then reinvest in other real estate a good idea? No, it's not. You should maintain leverage on all of your rental real estate. That's how you make the most money. So why would your house be any different? I know people sell you these funny myths. You should pay off your house early, blah 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 blah. You'll have all the security. It's, no you don't. If you don't think critically about any of this, maybe that's true, but like, I don't go for the finances should be so easy. It should be approachable to everybody, all that baloney. It's, if you can't get your thinking cap on, again, God bless, good luck. I'll well, be on the beach the people, over here. It's the people that think outside of the box that actually put that thinking cap on and say, how can I make this work better and make it more efficient? Those are the ones that are going to be able to go out there and profit from different things like that in real estate. Yeah. I'm actually doing one of those plans where I'm doing velocity banking to pay down the house a little bit earlier but I'm not paying it off. I'm probably going to pay halfway down. But what I'm doing this for is to increase my liquidity with that HELOC. I want right. to get that line of credit as large as possible. So when those good deals do come by, I've got the liquidity right. right there. Boom, I'm ready to snatch and it that, up. And that's one of the best things to do because you don't want your spendable or investable cash in the market somewhere in a risky place, right? But you don't want it sitting doing nothing. By it right. sitting in your house temporarily and reducing your HELOC payment, you're making three, four percent on that money guaranteed with no risk to it, except the fact that the HELOC might get turned off, which only happens like in extreme 2008 scenarios. So that's an ideal thing to do for short term needed investable capital. But like, the idea that like you should just have your money sit in your house unused because it provides you some kind of security, I almost, you could say that's like illogical because your home is real estate. It's an investment just like any other investment. It goes up and down in value. You could, and the beauty of real estate is you could completely drain all the equity out of it. It could go down in value by 50%. You would never get called on the loan. You, there's no margin call. There's no anything. You could just keep living there and you have access to that cash you took out. If you didn't take the cash out and your house went down 50%, you would have not have access to that money anymore. It would be like you literally lost the money. So I get that it's a little risky in some ways, but mathematically, especially if you can borrow at three and a half percent, now that you can only borrow at 7%, it's a different math equation, obviously. Yeah. But at 3%, you're like, when am I going to get 3% fixed? Where could well, I ever get that? Well, even at 7%, it's still historically low, right? But at the same time, house prices are at historic highs. So yeah. that kind of, you got to look at both sides of that equation. And like you said, that's the math in it. So I am a licensed real estate agent out here in Hawaii. That's what I do now that, that I've retired from the Navy. And clients I work with, they're right now nervous about the higher interest rates. And I tell them like, if this was back in May or earlier, and you were out there bidding on homes, you'd be bidding against 20 other people. I said, now people are scared. They're not going in. Yeah. Now's your time to go in and get that house that you wanted with no competition. As long as you could afford that payment at 7%, guess what? When it goes back down, you can refinance in six yeah. months to a year. That and now is... you've cut that payment down and you win the game because you got the house that you wanted. Now you're it's at an affordable payment that that is palpable to you, right? As long as the numbers work, even at the higher interest rate, I say go for it because it's going to come back down eventually. I don't have a crystal ball, so I don't know yeah, when. You never know. But it's going to. It's just, it's not sustainable at such high home prices right now. So eventually the Fed's going to recognize and say, okay, we need to bring this back down. But again, it's this battle that we're having right now with inflation. You can't print $4 trillion and then expect it to not affect the market years later. So right. that's the stuff but that the, we're the, going through. Way, though, the market needed to be tamped down. You know what I mean? Yeah. The money printing blew it up and now the interest rates are tamping it down. Both, all markets were insanely expensive in 2021. There was no market you could go into. 
basically that wasn't overpriced. So th I think buying real estate at higher interest rates, at least for investors, is certainly a, more ideal because you have an you have the opportunity for that refi even at a couple points lower or whatever. And the same is true for homeowners. But I think cost of prices are going to come down even further. And we're at the beginning of that. Yeah. And the house price lags behind the pain. The pain's in the market right now. So I say to some clients, listen, it's like you actually with HELOCs, generally you often get a better deal in higher rates because when rates were three, two, two and a half, three percent prime, you were getting prime plus one plus two. Now you're getting prime on your HELOC, which means if rates come down, your HELOC's gonna come down, right? So you go HELOC out of your house, you put some money into a completely depressed market, right? Rates come down, your HELOC lowers, the market goes up, it could end up being a super win, get the money out of real estate while real estate's still high, put it where tech and biotech, that's 75% off. Risky, yes. In some ways to say that in the long run, I don't know, but it's still hard emotionally to do those things. Like I've done it and like I'm toiling inside right now because I'm on this like crisscross of seeming <laughs> disaster. I'm just like, been through this before and you failed before and gotten scared, just stay the course. You, yep, I invested money that I didn't need to touch for a while. You invested it this way because it had a 20 year timeline. Just forget about it. Short term money, you wouldn't invest that way, obviously. But it's hard. It's a hard. I love money. I spend time thinking about it. I do the math. I have spreadsheets, everything. But the, my emotions get the better of me nearly every time. It's, you'd right. be surprised the right. things that go through your head. You've prepared. You're like, I've been through before. I'm never going to make that mistake again. Yada. And then the market starts tumbling and you're just like, should I sell? Oh my God. And you're like, why am I saying this to myself? It's a few people in there, but Actually, I'm glad you bring that up with mistakes and everything, because I want to transition this to the, uh, to something that we call the final round. It's where I'm going to ask you the same four questions that I ask everybody that comes on the show. But before we start that, you had mentioned something about emotions, like your emotions kick in. And I just want to say that is a hundred percent true because emotions are like, you don't realize how emotional each transaction you make is each time you stroke a check or you buy something, there is always emotion tied to your money. Whether you want to say, oh, this is just another investment property. There's emotion there, whether you want yeah. to believe it or not. So anyway, let's go ahead and get into this final round. So if you're ready to go, we'll get this party started. Let's do it. All right, Joe. So the first question I have for you is perfect because you just brought up mistakes. What is the biggest mistake you've ever made in your real estate investing? I don't want to say a mistake list, but I will say I feel like I've been pretty lucky with any kind of investing, real estate markets. It, I like to say actually luck is preparation meeting opportunity, and I ultimately believe that. But most really successful investors are the beneficiary of a good streak at one point or another. But in this case, I got lucky again. It could have been like one of the worst moves I made. I got lucky though. At the last minute, I was going to buy my first short-term rental property in Nashville. This was in my transition out of LA and Florida. I sold my house. I had a bunch of extra cash. I was like, what should we do? I'm like, I was thinking about the short-term rental thing. It was really hot at the time. It seemed like people were making a lot of money. I always did long-term and I was like, Nashville really hot. Nice. I liked it. I went there and just, I got up. I was looking at houses, house, this is eight, 2018, like they, they were really going fast. I got caught up in it and I just ended up like finally getting a place, but like I was paying too much, but I was like, it is what it is. And I just like forced myself to go through to the end and go all the way through escrow. And I looked at and, and inspected like three houses. So it wasn't like I was being like totally irrational, but I was like getting tired. I was getting fatigued. And I bought it and I felt like I was at a payment. I'm like, all right, in the long run, I think it'd be fine. The market's good. And I'm in escrow and I find out that town in East Nashville, like the citizens had been putting a huge pressure on the local council to change the short term rental laws. And like, I just didn't do enough research. Like I should have known this, but it was like new to me. And lo and behold, the laws passed while I was in escrow, I feel, if I remember correctly. And it's like, all of a sudden, you, in order to have a short-term rental in this area, you had to be an actual resident of the area. You had to be like renting out and like a detached on your property. You had to prove you're a resident, blah, 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 blah. And I just like really started panicking. But my realtor was like, people are getting around it. They're doing this. They're doing that. They're saying they live here. You might have to do your tax return here. And I'm just thinking, it's just getting like uglier and uglier. But 
basically I hadn't done enough research and I was stuck. Like I had a good amount of my deposit in and I just decided I'm going to press forward with it and see what happens. Lo and behold, on the last day, I was, I had literally sent my money to escrow. Okay. And it was like 400 grand. It was like not a small amount of money because I was going to buy it cash and refi it out and whatever. And the realtor calls me, goes, all right, so I just got a bomb dropped on me, but he's, but I think it's fine. But they're finally basically telling me that the property is subject to a lawsuit currently. They've been being sued by the city for not having the license for the short-term rental. And I'm buying it as a short-term rental. And the, my realtor is, but it's fine. I did the research. The lawsuit doesn't transfer to you. It stays with them. And I'm like, well, that's, of course it should. Why would it ever go to me? The problem is now, clearly I can't use this property as a short-term rental. Yeah. So I got my lawyer on the phone right away. I was like, they did not disclose this. I'm like, get on the phone. I'm out. I want my money back. Tell them not to send it through escrow. I got my money back. We didn't close it. This is last day. And wow. that situation keeps me up at night to this day. I'll be like, what if that didn't happen? Like, I feel like a higher power intervened, but yeah. it was a lack of research, not knowing what I was getting into with short-term rentals. It could have completely changed the course of my life because that money I got back, I ended up buying the rental property where I live now. That served a huge purpose. It allowed me to buy the house we live in. Like that money would have been tied up. It would have been hard to refile. That's a long story, but biggest mistake that I almost made. Yeah, Joe, that's insane. It's, yeah. You know what, actually this next question kind of ties into this, right? You can work on, work that out with this one. But the next question is, what is something that you've, that you wish you knew when you first started? Be prepared, do the research for anything, do the math, do the math and do yeah. the math is a mathematical concept, but it, it replies just generally speaking, like at some point you have to give up on the math and just go forward and risk it. You know what I mean? Like you, there is a leap of faith made with all investments, as you say, get over the emotion, whatever, but Spend some time as practical and as practical amount of time to just be as prepared as possible. You know, doing your finances, tracking your spending income and expenses, knowing how much you're saving, knowing how much you're investing, knowing how much return you need to get to your goal. That's all easy research. It's easy preparation to do. And it like just it makes literally all the difference. And it's your life we're talking about. When I talk to my clients, I'm like, we're talking about your future. Like here, we're not talking about my future. Like I'm good. I'm at your future. You need to like be, want to do the homework or suffer the consequence of being in the double wide by the highway. As I like to say, I live in Florida, go down the highway, endless trailer parks, double wides, single wides even. And often I say to myself, either those are incredibly frugal people, or those are people who do not do enough preparation, but I doubt any yeah. of them is loving living in the trailer park. But the trailer park is there for a reason. No, that's a great <clears throat> point. All right. All right, Joe. So the next question also ties into this, and it's going to be something that's useful for our listeners. But do you have any tips or tricks that you would recommend to someone that is just getting started today? It all goes back to tracking your finances. Like, it's the most fundamental thing. Like, without doing that, you have no data. And we live in the world of data now, so everyone gets data. And without data, you can't make good decisions. But I would say outside of that, I like to say, teach yourself how to do everything. It always comes in handy. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. I appreciate and that. And people are like, that's crazy. What kind of advice is that? That <laughs> sounds like a ton of work. And I'm like, yeah, it is. Life is hard. Success is hard. You have, you have to put in work. Yeah. Failure is easy. Success is hard. That's how it goes. Yeah. <clears throat> no, it's great. Great point. All right. Final question. Do you have a favorite business, investing, or real estate related book or podcast or both? What, one of my uh, most useful real estate investing books that I read was The Loopholes of Real Estate by Garrett Sutton. Learned a ton in there. Talks about real estate and also about entities. Entities most specifically to real estate, but a lot of the information is like even for business entities and what have you. So I like that a lot. Another book that I read recently that admittedly is like a sales brochure for this guy's company and product, but I think it has a lot of really useful information. It's called The Lost Science of Compound Interest. Talks a lot about the shortcomings of like current day retirement planning concepts and how they're just inherently 
flawed and like pretty much by design will come up short unless you like completely save a ton of money, which most people in America and or the world will never do. Yeah, no, great recommendations. Thank you for that. Okay, Joe. That is it for the final round. You survived. Congratulations. Right. No. Absolutely, man. Hey, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. But listen, I actually have one more question for you. And this is probably the most important question of all, right? Because we're having this conversation and doing this interview. You brought up some very great points, very good golden nuggets for people to take away, including those three pillars that you talked about, which I think is fantastic. So people listening to this conversation, I want to know more about Joe. And what yeah. he's doing and everything like that. So can you share maybe your website or social media? Do you have anything like that you could share with us oh, yeah, uh, so people could find you? Yeah, yeah. My new business, as I mentioned, is being this fractional CFO, but it does all live on this website, playlouder.com. That's my website. And the website is honestly focused more to delivering information from the personal finance like point of view and for individuals. So I have tons of free info. Everything I said is on there for free. You can learn everything I know for free. That said... If you want a distilled version of information that will save you a ton of time, I have paid courses in each of the pillars. So I have a course in personal finance retirement planning called the Financial Independence Roadmap. It just distills all the info you need to know in a short focus course because everybody's busy. I got a pillar in the entrepreneurial section, which is about creating an entity for your business or your side hustle, using it to protect your assets and save money in taxes. And then I have a course in the real estate investing pillar where I basically give them a spreadsheet of how I tracked all my real estate investments and how I know they're going to be successful over time and a whole course on like how to use it and how to understand how real estate investment profits materialize net of taxes and fees, which is the critical component of that. Yeah, no, fantastic. So it, that's where you guys could find Joe. I will make sure I have those links in our show notes to make it easy for you. So you can just copy and paste or click away. Just don't do it while you're driving. Joe, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. It was fantastic, man. This was a great conversation. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it, man. Absolutely. And hey, to my listeners, thank you so much for joining me and our special guest, Joe DeSanto, on the Average Joe Finances podcast. Go leave us a five-star review and tell us what you liked about today's episode with Joe. And what a great name to have on this podcast. Exactly. Average Joe Finances Average and Joe. Average Joe. <laughs> All right. Aloha from Hawaii and have a great rest of your day. Thank you for making it to the end of this episode. Greatly appreciate you being here with me today on the Average Joe Finances podcast. If you haven't done so yet, make this the episode that you go leave us a five-star rating or subscribe to our YouTube channel. The Average Joe Finances podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only. Have an outstanding day.